Hi, people. Um, sorry for the slight delay. We were waiting for the microphone to, to, to reach us. So, uh, uh, welcome here. Uh, really happy that you all came here. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Shalaev. Uh, I work for a company called Zero Turnaround. And today we're going to talk about uh, monads uh, as a concept and we'll the, take a practical approach to try to understand the, the monads as a concept. And we'll obviously all the examples, all the code samples will be using Java uh, because, well, I'm mainly Java developer, so uh, uh, the examples will be using Java 8 uh, as the first version of Java supporting functional features uh, mostly. So this would be a fairly Mm, not a very theoretical or deep uh, talk, but if you if you if you want something much more uh, applicable in real life, so just n not to disappoint you, uh, there was a great session in, on track E uh, about tests, and that that those skills you can apply immediately. So we'll be talking about some fundamental concepts. So if you want to maybe enhance your understanding of uh, algebraic types or something, just stay with me, and we'll we'll be fine. So, unlocking the magic of monads in, uh, with Java 8. Uh, first, uh, a couple of words about me, just to convince you that you should believe me that I'm knowledgeable of, about this stuff. Uh, so, I work for Zero Around, which is a company. Uh, I'm from Estonia, uh, and my main responsibility there as a developer advocate is to uh, care about community. I run the blog content engine called Rebel Labs, where we publish content. I am present in social network uh, Twitter. You can like, find me there, follow me, and ask me any questions. Uh, and I'll be happy to chat with you on any topics. So Zero Turnaround is a producer of tools for Java developers. We have currently two. Uh, one is JRebel, that is a productivity enhancer for Java developers. And XRebel is a lightweight Java profiler. So if you check those out, my employer will be happy and they will send me to many more conferences around the world and I can talk to you people and other people and I will be happy as well. So uh, that's a short introduction. So if we want to, if we talk about what we want to achieve here during this session. So first we want to learn some stuff. We want to learn about what the moment is. Uh, we want to understand how to apply that, how to figure out which parts of code are monadic what, what parts of code are not. So if you, if you in the future, find a, a piece of code that looks like something you saw here, you will be like, oh, that's a monad. I can, I can reason about this piece of code now. Amazing, sorry about this, the TV flickers, some, some things. So, and we're gonna take a very practical approach here. We will pose a real world problem and we'll try to define that, and then we'll try to gradually solve that in a way that uh, allows us to learn about monads. So what we don't want to do here, we want to ignore a very low level concept or very like theoretical concepts like ad hoc polymorphism or parametric polymorphism, which is better. Uh, if, you, if you saw the session uh, by Victor Polishuk about types just, just before this, uh, you know that it can get quite theory heavy, uh, and we will try, try to take a much lighter approach and still learn something. So let's start with a little introduction. So obviously, how many of you are Java developers, mainly using Java as a primary language? Yeah, so the most of you. And, and since some time, Java was like before Java 8, uh, it was lacking all the main uh, features that makes, make a good uh, functional language, right? There was no functions of the first class citizens. And, and even when they appeared, there were some limitations and everything. So people were really saying that, oh, maybe Java is not the best language to do, to do functional programming or to apply concepts for that. Well, as you can see, there are many more things in this world that do not make much sense at the first sight, uh, like this coffee, coffee tasting uh, potato chips. So uh, anyway, with Java 8, we got lambdas, we got functional interfaces, so now we can take things uh, and using a very conventional syntax of parentheses and uh, arrows, we can assign them into values. Uh, 
uh, into fields and values, and we can pass them around and treat functions as any any kind of any normal object. So uh, just a qu quick recap, everyone of you should, should know this already, so I won't spend time. You have functional interfaces, which is like declares a single abstract method. We have method references where you can, uh, just using like double column syntax, you can just assign that somewhere, uh, basically obtaining an instance of, say, the function interface or something. Uh, and we can actually specify the body of the function using, well, the Lambda notation, right? So all that should be clear. Java 8 was released like a long time ago. Java 7 is end of life. This, this is all clear, right? We won't spend any time with that. Uh, but we will need this, those syntax, syntax primitives to, to actually talk about monads. And it's not a concept that is very easy to grasp. And, and, and it's not a very like user-friendly concept, right? So most of you probably heard something about monads and know that it's a very, like, very buzz word uh, that people like to argue about on the internet. Who saw at least the one the agreement or like a blog post somewhere about monads on the internet? Uh, not many, but the thing is, like, uh, there is a paradox that, like, as soon as you int uh, understand monads, you are urged to go and write a blog post about that because it becomes kind of easy and you can understand how other people can understand. So the internet is full of tutorials how to get that uh, and they usually take a very theoretical approach that try to uh, impose Haskell on, on people and try to impose like type system limitations and everything and they're like, oh, we are, we go from math and we want to like bound side effects and anything. And to me, that seems a little bit an overkill. So it's kind of the same way, if you want to build a bridge over like a river somewhere in the backyard, like you will need some basic grasp of physics, but it would be an overkill to go and learn quantum physics just to build that like tiny construction. So much easier would be just to start doing that and figure details on the go, right? So like much, much more practical approach. And this is what we'll, 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 we'll get there. We'll define a problem uh, and we'll solve it. So the problem that we're going to solve would be the callback hell. So and callback hell uh, is, uh, is a problem when you structure your code in a way. Who knows what a callback is? So you specify a function that will be executed somewhere after some event ap appears, right? So you, you say what to do later uh, in some moment of time, and you usually pass that as a parameter to other functions. So the, it becomes a problem Actual, an actual problem when the when the code becomes heavier and larger. So you start you start calling functions and specifying a callback, and then you uh, specify a next function and callback again and the callback again and callback again. And it kind of seems simple when you actually have just a pseudo code here, but when you actually imagine that you will specify functionality in those in those inside of those callbacks, uh, it will get messier. And it gets messier and messier because the code tends to go right and right and right because every time you specify a callback, you, you actually go one level deeper in, in, in the callback chain. So first of all, the problem would be that you have to pass all the parameters in there and you have to somehow manage that. And the second problem will be if anything goes wrong and you know, like as developers, that like we think and we like leave corner cases. But the successful pass is always easy, but uh, what happens when exceptions occur. So with callbacks, it's only, only not, not that easy to propagate errors back, and also because of this going right and right and right. So this code would be much easier and much simpler if we could do something different. If we only we could specify the computations that we want to, uh, we want the machine to produce uh, in a very straightforward, top to bottom manner. Say, we want some kind of API that will allow us to specify that, oh, when this happens, please produce me, produce this computation and figure out that thing. And then when that is done, please just call this different method. And then, and then, and then, and then in the future, you specify uh, and the code flows uh, in a straight line. So, so this is what we want to do. And obviously, we, we're going to solve that using types. 
right? Like any, any problem that you want to solve in, in Java will include creating classes. So uh, to create classes, we need types. Uh, and since we want a type that represents something that will happen in the future, obviously we, we need a type to represent a result of a synchronous computation. Well, luckily, luckily we have 20 years of Java uh, uh, development to support us, so we have those types. So we have a Java util concurrent future, which does exactly that. It specifies the result and like, represents the result of a synchronous computation, and it has the following API. So you can parameterize a future with the value that it will produce. It has the following API. It has the, the method to query if this the future actually occurred yet. So method is done will return if the future is ready or not. And you can get the value. And the get will be blocking. So once you call that, you have no other means other than wait till the result will, will, will produce itself. So and we have this result, and we can use that, but there is no way of specifying that, that computations that will happen further and further in the future. Right? We only can query things, and we absolutely have no means to, to achieve whatever we wanted to achieve, to avoid the callback hell. So the question is, can we do better? And this would be the problem that we'll solve in the next 40 minutes. And obviously, we hear this the first time in this talk, almost the first time in this talk, when we talk about monads. So solving async and callback hell uh, using monads, obviously, we'll, 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 we'll have to look at this definition. This is a Haskell code to specify class monad. So what you should see on this picture, what you should see on this picture, instead of the Haskell code, you want to see this. You want to see, this, you want to understand that the definition of this monad is like three lines long. So any developer should understand that, like, even if the Haskell is very impressive and everything, three lines of code is kind of easy to grasp in 45 minutes. So we'll do exactly that. So don't be scared. Uh, but the Haskell way doesn't lead us anywhere. If we look at the mathematical way of uh, trying to understand what a monad is, then we will also reach nowhere because, well, the definition of a monad is uh, quite cumbersome. But we all know it is known. It is known for a long time that, well, it's, it's nothing, nothing fancy, actually. You could discover monads yourself, and everybody should, should be able to comprehend that and at least recognize them in the code. So let's talk about metaphors. There are very many. Uh, so you can, you can see an example of those. Sometimes monads are said to be like boxes. And we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. Sometimes monads are said to be elephants, like a chain of elephants, holding, like you can imagine a family of elephants going to water when one elephant like, grabs the second elephant's tail and they form a chain of that. What they call burritos or any kind of food, uh, which, you, which, you, which is a great metaphor, so we'll, 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 in a moment, we'll see why is that. So the best metaphor that I have found on the, anywhere on the internet, what a monad is, so what we're going to work with, is those like matryoshka fish thingies. So every, every fish here uh, contains something inside itself. So in this, in this term, this metaphor is applicable as a box. You can take a smaller fish and put it in a bigger fish, and then into a bigger fish. Well, you all know how matryoshkas work, right? So, and inside this, the smallest fish, there is this stone that you can put there uh, and, and contain in there. And also there are transitions between those fishes, which is obviously exactly what we want, because we want, well, if we look back at what we wanted to do, we wanted to derive a type where we can apply operations and still be in, in, in the type system. So we cannot just say, oh, let's, let's go talk about fish. So it's all about types. But all those metaphors, all those intuitions, actually, they tell us, or they want to teach us two things about monads. There are basically, the functionality of a monad is very limited, right? There are two things that they want to do. They are able to wrap things around, like as a big fish wraps a smaller fish, or, and they chain functions, like those elephants, uh, they chain functions together. Uh, that's it. 
So basically what we want to do, we want to derive type because we agreed that we will be working in types. And we want this type to be able to wrap things and chain functions. So that is it. That is our specifications in, in plain English about what a monad is. Well, to be precisely true, monad is not a type, but a type class. So if you want to talk about that, please don't ask me any tricky questions. We will uh, we'll av avoid that uh, because that is a road to nowhere as well, my precious monads. Uh, but talking about the specification, so let's try to translate the English version of that wrapping things and chaining functions into Java code. So to actually create this type. And this is very useful. This might be a very useful skill for any kind of problem that you want to solve using code. You, you just first describe what you want to do and then you try to translate concepts well, basically map, map them one-to-one -one into, into Java, into any programming language. So the wrapping functionality of Monad will be represented by the method called return, where it, it will, call, will be called pure. Uh, and the specification for that, the Java doc for that, will be that it will take an instance of some class called A, and it will return a monad wrapping that class and wrapping that value. So in a sense, if we think about how, to, how, how Java creates things, that would be constructor. Right? The only way to like, create an object of some, some, some type is to call a constructor or we'll call a factor method. But basically, we need to create a constructor. And if we translate this uh, take instance of A, return the instance of a monad over A into Java code, we will see this. So we'll talk about interfaces because we actually don't yet know what's, what's the, what will be inside the code. So it's just, just pure, pure abstraction here. So we have an instance, uh, we have an interface monad over some values. And the method pure will take a value of that type and return the monad over that values. So as simple as that. And this is the direct translation of, of that English sentence. So as you, can, as you remember, we had like two, me two, me two methods to do. We have wrapping and we have chaining. So we're halfway there. The second part will be chaining. And uh, the chain signature will, it will do this. It will take a monad and it will take a function because we want to chain functions. And it will return a monad over a different type. So we, 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 we take a monad of A and we take a function from whatever is inside that monad and the function produces a different one. And that will return. So in terms of Java code, which is probably much simpler for you to understand, the bind, the bind specification will be this. Uh, as a parameter, it takes a function from value of V into monads of R and it will return the monads of R. So, and since we have this instance available to us, it's an instance method, right? We have, we have this present, that would be our initial model, monad. So we'll just take a monad and a function and return a different monad. Boom, done. So this is our definition, this is our interface that we're gonna implement to, to, to build any kinds of monads, right? This follows the requirements that we, we needed for Monad. And we will, be, we will be build something that implements this to solve the callback hell. So go into code. We'll create a type called promise. And it will represent a result of a synchronous computation because now we are tying back to the callback uh, problem, we wanted to represent asynchronous computations, so we'll do that with a promise. It will be kind of like future, uh, and it will build an, uh, upon, upon it, but it will also support, obviously, pure and bind, because we need to in implement the interface of the monad. Still f following? Who follows me yet? Oh, that's amazing. That's, that's great. Uh, so. Imagine, imagine we have this app, not abstract, but some kind of code that is a class promise, 
and it implements future operations. So it's kind of like exactly a future. Uh, but on top of that, you can uh, finish this promise and say, oh, now this operation is done. Right? So somewhere in the background asynchronously it runs, but you can say, oh, boom, done. Now you are a finished promise, now you are a reality, and you do that using invoke. And you can specify a callback, because that would be really unfair to try to solve the callback problem without being able to specify a callback. That would be like a chicken and egg problem. So we'll have callbacks and we'll allow ourselves to have callbacks, because we do have them, and we'll allow ourselves to finish a promise. So now, to, to specify, to implement the pure operation, which was the pure of a value, and it returns a promise. It will return a mounted promise. We just create that, and we invoke, invoke it with this value. So what we do, essentially, if you, if you think about that, we create a new, new object, and we take the value v and put that into, the pro, into this promise object. And we say, oh, now you contain that. So this is exactly this wrapping functionality. We just go from the domain of values into the domain of monads. Right? We wrap that, and now we can work on, on the promises. So this is very simple. This is just like a, a very general Java code. Now we'll get into this uh, more functional part of, 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 of the monadic code. So imagine we already have a promise of, of some value v. And we bind the function from those values into another promise. So the code will look like, like this. Let's take this apart. So don't, don't strain your eyes trying to read all of that. So in the beginning, we declare a new promise of the type that we want to get. Right? We want to return a promise of R, and we specify the, the, the variable that says, oh, I'm a promise of R. And well, that's obvious. We, we, we have to return something. And now we'll see that actually the code, the only thing that we can do with the value is to satisfy the type system would be to straightforwardly obtain the value of the initial promise. We, want, we need v because the function takes v as the first argument. And we take that and say, so when, when we, this promise, when this instance will be finished, when the ongoing computation that is represented by this instance will be finished, we, we, we want to get the value out of that with this blocking get method, which won't be blocking because the computation is finished. So with on redeem, we specify a callback. So now we have this value v that was sitting inside the first promise, and we can only do one thing, right? We have a, a value v, and we have a function that takes those so the natural thing will be take that and apply the function. And we, we get the, as a result, we get the promise of R, because that's what type system says, because we have a function from V to promise R. And when that promise succeeds, we just return that into the original result, result value that we'll return. So now we specify two callbacks. One callback was into this promise, and the second callback will be when the function will succeed. But as a result, we get the promise R that we return and we can pass further. So with those two callbacks, what we did, we encapsulated this uh, application of those callbacks, and we will be able to operate always on promises. And you bind the function into a promise, and you get the promise back. And what you can do next, you can bind another function into the resulting promise, and you can get a new promise back. And with that, with, with, with encapsulating those callbacks inside this code, inside this monad, what we get, we get exactly the desired behavior that we can operate in a straightforward, in a like, top to bottom fashion. So we don't have to go further and further into callbacks because it's all written here. So we'll, 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 we just implemented, we implemented the pure method and the bind method from the promise, uh, from the monad interface. Uh, so basically, we are done, right? We created something, and let's see how it behaves. So here I will cheat a little bit because, well, 
we talked about that in the beginning, we want to be really practical here, right? Uh, we don't want to stay in the algebraic types. So whenever I have a promise, I want to specify a method called get to actually to observe what value is inside that promise. So, and it will work exactly like future get, so it will blockingly wait, and the code, code is not here, so treat this as a pseudocode. So, but it, what it will get you, it will make you go from the domain of promises back to regional values. This is, might be unnecessary if you think about this, because when you have a promise, you can always specify what computation to do next, and what computation to do next, and next, and next, and next, and you can go and compute anything, as long as it's, well, computable. Uh, but just to be simple, because, well, uh, I'm a very simple person, I think locally, and when I can obtain something more understandable and easier to comprehend, like V here instead of promises, I want to do that. And since I'm the master of this code, I just claim that we'll have a get method on the promise to go back from the domain of values into, uh, of promises into values. So now we have an example of the code. So imagine we, we have this code that somehow produces the first promise. So we can, what we can do with the promise p here, we can bind the function, and we just specify that this function will take a string, and it will return a promise of integers. Fairly simple. And at the end of that, because we, are, uh, we don't want to stay in the prom domain of promises, we can get the result back. So this would code will look like uh, on, 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 in, in terms of promises. So, and with that, we can bind and bind and bind things further and further and further and still go on the same slide. You just, the margins here are just too narrow for, for that. So now we got the code working. So here is a checkpoint. So to, 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 to understand if you're still with me. Hopefully you are. So up to this point, we said that we want to solve a callback help problem. We want to derive a monad, uh, a monad, and we created a promise, the type that represents a synchronous computation that satisfies the interface for monads that we declared. The, it, it will be able to handle both values and exceptions because we, we operate in this straightforward manner, and it supports chaining and functions. So this is what we did so far, and I hope like people are on board with this. So now the question would stand be, 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 before us is like seriously, like what what did we do just now? So and how useful is that? And what's what's the actual value of that? We created a monad, we implemented an interface, and we will have to talk about the duality of monads as type classes and actual instances of the monads. So just like, just like the list of generic T parameter versus list of say integers at different types and different things that you can, can, well, you should consider them being different, monads and instances of monads are different things. So what we created, the promise, is an instance of a monad. It's something that takes the generic concept and specializes that to represent a result of a synchronous computation. But we could do different things. We can solve a different problem. Say we don't want to specify the time casualty, but we want to specify a format. And we could create, a, for example, a list that implements the same monad interface. So the pure will be creating a list of objects, and the bind will be mapping a function over all the elements of the list. And the monad list will specify the context for our computation. It is the order of values, the same way as promise specifies the time order of computations. So the reason why we want to do this is because we want to specify common API. We want to specify functionality that will work for all the monads. We want generic functions that will work for promises, for lists, for any other monads that you can come up with based on the two, two, two methods that we have, wrapping and chaining. Yeah, 
So, for example, for example, what we could do, a useful method for that would be, for example, a sequence. So, or a zip to pair things together. So, if you think a sequence of promises will be a joint result of uh, application of the functions once over second and so forth. Or a sequence of elephants will be a, a chain of those elephants successfully going to water or a sequence of lists using the same code, just specifying the sequence function, will produce a sequence of lists like one big concatenated list. The reason for that is that we can preserve the context of this computation, which is amazing. So it might look in the API, on the API level, it might look like that. So a sequence function will take a series of monads and will produce a monad over sequence of values. And you can apply that to any monad. So, and that's, that's, where it, that's why people rave about monads so much, because it allows to specify generic operations that behave on any type that we, we can come up with and, and, and just work uh, with code reuse, which is, which is great. So the problem is, it's kind of limited under the parameterized polymorphism of of, of, of Java. So you can imagine if we take, have monads of V here as a parameter, we cannot just put any interface there and, well, we can't put any interface there, but the result type will be monad, which is kind of inconvenient. So what we can do, what we can do though, is to specify this code somewhere in a single place, right? And then as we are very practical, people will just copy that and change the types into whatever we need. So we'll have the sequence, the functionality for sequence of monads, and we copy that and we replace monad with promise and we'll get the code from sequence of promises. Which is maybe not the very best engineering solution, uh, but as the usefulness of this goes, this is pretty much better than nothing, right? So we can specify common functions, uh, over the interface that looks like that. But thing is, here we go on the shaky ground. Who knows how do we implement a monad? What happens if, if a monad just blows up a universe and we apply those common functions and instead of having a meaningful result uh, because of the implementation of a monad, just the universe blows up? That would be a very sad day. So smart people, smart people, came up with a limitation. And that limitation is not enforced in the type system in any way, but it is kind of specified as laws of monad. So any, any good monad should follow a couple of laws, like it shouldn't harm a human being, and should obey the orders, and so forth. And in, in the Haskell notation, those look like that. And now there are three of them. There is left identity, right identity, and associativity, and we'll go one by one from them. So the left identity rule law of monads will look like that. So it checks that the bind behaves correctly. It checks that if you, if you have those in instance of monad, and it should do this. Any well-behaved and well-grown instance of monad should uh, preserve those laws, otherwise it would be un unmanageable to use them. So the left identity says that if we take a value v and wrap it in pure and obtain a monad and apply the function to that, it should be equivalent, there is a three lines here, boom, uh, the equivalence symbol to just applying the function over the value. So we'll talk about this equivalence in a second, but this is much more comprehensive to you. You can understand that, right? At least you can guess what it means. So, and that's it. So we check if bind behaves correctly. Now the right identity rule checks that pure behaves correctly, and it says that if we have a monad and we wrap a function that does nothing but returns monad, then we get the same value. We get an equivalent value to what we had initially. Which makes sense. It's kind of like if we perform an operation that does nothing, we should get the equivalent result as we, as we started with. So that's easy. That is also understandable. There is a method of reference here. So we just 
change that. So an associativity rule says that if we have two functions and we bind them in order, then it would be equivalent to binding a function that is a combination of those. Which should be very meaningful because we do want to reason about like what happens if we do chain more the single the single function. So those are the rules, and when you implement a monad, you should check that your instance, the code that you have written, specific like follows this description, which is which is great and which is easy. But now it's a problem, right? This equivalence operator. There is no such thing in Java on the JVM. So with some platforms or with mathematical notations, that is very easy. If you have equivalence, it's like great. If you don't have any equivalence operators, as we do have on, on, on JVM, we do know that two applications of the same function on the same values are not equivalent. Like they can pr produce different results. Uh, plus, even if we want to compare objects, which will be like what we operate on, we have to think about equals, we have to think about hash codes. So defining, defining equivalence is not, is not very easy. And here we will cheat again and we'll say like, you know what, this is our platform. We will care about that when we, when we have to, but the equivalence will be this, a very, very vague definition of equivalence. The side effects of the computations will be similar. If one part of the equality blows the universe, we would expect the second part of the equality blow the universe as well. That's reasonable. And if the first part doesn't blow the universe and produces the result, say, 42, we would expect the right hand of, the equivalent, of this equivalence produce 42 as well. And while those 42s might be different 42s, or like different objects, specifying whatever, we, we want them to be kind of on the same level, similar, so we can work with them. So when we have this identity, and we want to prove that some, some code follows some specification, what do we do? Who knows what do we do when we want to figure out like if the code specifies a specification? Yeah, exactly, we run tests. So if we would be mathematicians, we would write proofs. If we would be coding Haskell, we would just rely on a type system. It compiles, it works, ship it. But in Java, we will write tests and we'll use asserts to, to, to say if the certain code behaves the way we believe it behaves or not. And while that is not a very significant scientific approach, it kind of works in, works in reality. I believe you all have written code that is tested. I believe that that code is not tested fully 100%, and you still kind of know that it works, and you can sleep well while it runs somewhere in production. So to test the test for the left identity would be the following. We say take our function, and we'll test promise, the instance of the monad called promise that we derived, and we'll say that if it is a promise of Boolean, no, if it is a promise on the left hand side here in the assert, we take the promise of a value, which is an integer, and bind the function and get the result. See how useful the get is. Now we can test things. We can peek into the promise inside of that. So if we pure, like if we pure the value and bind it with a, with a function, it is, will be equivalent, and assert equals here is very uh, weak definition of this equals, was strict, then it will be equal to applying the function of this value. And the types work out, so we will get the promise of Boolean in any case. And if this test passes, you know that your monad kind of satisfies the left identity law, at least for some cases. The more tests you have, the more sure you will be in that. But that works like with any functionality. So the right identity rule is Exactly the same as we as we showed that on in the in the previous slides. So if we take a promise of a value and bind the promise pure in there, then we should get the initial value when we observe that. And we can check the hash code as well if we want to be really strict. And on integers that might work, might not work. 
but in a sense, you have you can you have a mean to specify that your your monad instance behaves the way it should behave. So whenever you release that, and other people will use that, and it will apply those great generic functions to sequence your monads or I don't know, zip it or whatever else you, you can do with those, they won't blow up the universe and they won't be calling you back saying, oh, that doesn't work. So you write tests and you, with that you specify your safety margin. So now obviously it's time to wrap this up. We don't have that much time left. So here, of course, we defined a type called promise and it represents the result of synchronous computation and it is monadic and I have a code on GitHub and I will give a link in, in a second. But like, don't use that introduction. You can like, see that and play with that. But if you want this monadic asynchronous result type definition, JDK 8 comes with a completable feature, which is a monadic code. It doesn't implement the interface monad because people designing that were sensible people. But it behaves exactly the same way. So you can obtain a completable feature of some value. And what you can do, you can apply the functions to be executed with that value as an argument. And you can apply them in the same thread where you can say that, oh, I want this in the next computation to be, bind, uh, to be bound or executed asynchronously. And it will use the forging pool or whatever means that JVM has to, for background execution of functions. And it will only work out much better than the homegrown promise uh, thing that we derived on those three slides. So if you want to, uh, to, to, to see how to do that, or how to use it properly, or different implementations, so there is a great talk by Tomasz, by Tomasz about how to use completely future, um, and an amazing talk, uh, check that out. It's a full hour, so you won't be able to do that, to run that during a break, but it, it is a great talk. And I'll put the slides online and tweet them, and probably the conference organizers will, will publish the slides also in some way. So you'll get the link. Don't have to type it furiously, but if you want, you can do. So we have the completable future, which is an instance of a monad, where it, it's, a, it's something that is a monadic code, right? It binds functions. It's not the only monad that's available in the JDK. So there is a type that is very well described by this amazing picture representing the Schrodinger's cat experiment where the cat can be simultaneously uh, alive or not so. And who knows what, what type I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. So this is, this is a, an optional. So this is, this is the picture that represents type that can be either present or not present. And until you peek into that, you don't know. So let's see if optional corresponds to our definition of, of a monad. So the pure value, the pure method, Obviously, optional doesn't implement a monad interface as well, naturally. Because JDK 8 came out before I created this presentation. Obviously, that's the only reason. So, but there is a method that corresponds to the signature of, of a pure method, and it's called off. So it takes a value and returns an optional of that value. Amazing, pure is there, where you can get a nullable and get an empty optional if you, if you wish. And there is a method called, called flat map that represents exactly, it follows the signature of the bind thing. So it takes a function from the values inside the optional and returns a new optional, which is exactly what we, what we did with the bind on the promise and exactly what we specified in the interface of monad. So the code here is not exactly that important, but it's exactly what it is. It is there. So the flat map is our optional's bind. So Optional is a proper monad. It implements things. And you can test optional, and there are tests to do this and that and bind and flat map things. And it does satisfy the laws of a monad. So you can safely build functions on top of the optionals. There is also a function called map, but don't, don't, don't mix those. And how to, how to figure out if a flat map is a bind or a map is a bind? Well, obvious answer is to look for the signature. A signature of map doesn't take a function from a value to an optional, so it's, it's not our bind. 
it looks very similar and it behaves similar, but it's not the bind. So there is a difference and be, be aware of that. So always look for the signatures. That's it. So JDK has at least two monadic types. Hopefully you understand now what makes those types monadic. Hopefully you, if you ever encounter yourself writing like tons of callbacks, you will think maybe I should use proper types for that. Or you will use optionals here and there. And next time you see a picture like that, you will be like, oh, I know what, 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 what we're talking about. Or uh, if you hear something about monads, you'll be, yes, I heard that amazing presentation on amazing Java Day Kiev conference. Uh, and, and, and I know what a monad is, or an instance, or why do we care to create the generic sequence function. function. Why did I talk about this in conclusion? So why, why, why you all gather here is because knowing more things and understanding more things, hopefully, is more pleasant and useful in life than understanding less. So first, you won't embarrass yourself. Second, it will make you maybe build on top of this knowledge uh, in the future. And don't want to, you won't embarrass yourself publicly or privately within the team. Like that poor guy. That's a real conversation on Twitter, actually. A very sad moment in his life. So hopefully you understand a little bit more what a uh, monad is. So we talk about the callback help problem here. We devised a monadic solution for that. We devised an interface of a monad. We wrote the code for the promise and we discarded that code in favor of complete the future. So that is it. That is it. We'll get any questions really soon. So uh, just in the end, to make my employer happy as well, uh, you can go and check the products that we do. Java developers really love those. Usually are very happy. So you can check it out on your free time. But uh, you can find the code for the promise if you want to play with this on the GitHub on the link here, and obviously you can contact me and ask any questions, which we could do now as well, if we have time. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Well, that's great, because we're out of our 50 minutes. Oh, yeah, by the way, before you went away, this is the great thing. So in, in, on track A, Venkat is talking about functional programming and the reasons to adapt that. So now with this knowledge, you can go there and ask all the tricky questions there and give him a hard time. <laughs> Don't tell I sent you. Thanks a lot.